So, like I was saying, uh, we collaborate with uh, the Double Genome Project VGP in on the second version of the pipeline based on uh, PacBio Reads Hi Fi, uh, and still using scaffolding with uh, BioNano CMAP and uh, HiC. So, the pipeline in Galaxy is divided in 10 different uh, workflow. So, you can see on the left, we have three separate tracks for the initial assembly using PacBio Hi Fi Reads depending on what data are available. Uh, you have a regular mode using only PacBio Hi-Fi. You have a HiC mode using the HiC data uh, for the initial phasing of the assembly. And you have a trio mode uh, because for some projects we have data from the parents of the sequence individual. Uh, the data from the parents are Illumina data. Um, in every case, the first uh, workflow is uh, camera profiling workflow using uh, GenomeScope and Merrill to uh, evaluate. Uh, so the camera profile, the size of the genome, the percentage of heterozygacy, and uh, different parameters that are going to be used in uh, downstream analysis. The next step is uh, high -fizem, using high -fizem to assemble the genome. Uh, so in that case, we have uh, simple high -fizem, simple mode high -fizem, phasing using IC or trio mode. Uh, this Workflow include um, three tools for the quality control, including uh, Mercury, Busco, and uh, GFSTAS. Uh, GFSTAS provide um, simple statistics about the gym assembly, such as NC50, uh, this kind of data. Uh, Busco evaluates the presence of autologs and the completeness of the genome, and Mercury evaluates the level of duplication, um, among other things. Uh, depending on the results of Mercury, uh, the purge dupe, uh, the first one after the, the three parallel tracks, uh, can be used to remove duplicated haplotypes. Uh, if it's needed, it's an optional step. Uh, by another song, it's optional as well because a lot of projects don't have necessarily the bio data. Uh, and the third step is using SASA for uh, scaffolding with high C data. Uh, two steps of scaffolding use uh, pretext and uh, GFS tasks. Pretext provide a map of uh, contact with IC to evaluate the uh, completeness of the scaffolds. Uh, so since this uh, pipeline has been available uh, six months ago, uh, it has been used on 21 genome uh, for the next six months, 10 birds, two amphibians, two fish, six mammals, and one reptile. Uh, there's four more that are currently uh, being assembled. The largest real genome uh, among this is the four um, giga base for the Eastern Narrows tool, and it has been assembled using uh, the high C, high Fizen based assembly. Uh, we also have the Wallaby and the Hawaiian Pro picture here. Um, among this genome, we also have the Zebra Finch, which is a well known genome, and we generated three new assemblies for this uh, bird, which has a high level of heterozygous. So we have the three different modes, high Fizen, high Fizen, high C phasing, and high Fizen trio. And without surprise here, like the high Fizen trio provide the most complete, uh, the highest level of phasing. Uh, after the high C scaffolding, the full pipeline, we have uh, nearly fully phased chromosomes. You can see on the right, the uh, contacts uh, map uh, with pretext before on the top and after on the bottom, uh, the high C scaffolding. We also have a decontamination workflow including the pipeline, and we evaluated it on this uh, on 19 of this genome, and we compared it with decontamination, decontamination by hand. So we removed contaminants and mitochondrial genome, uh, and among these 19 assembly, 12 of them provide exactly the same results that you would get with manual decontamination. And among 321 scaffold that has been identified as a contaminant, uh, we have four positive and six false negative, uh, although. Among the false positives, some evidence later indicate that they might be actual uh, positive. But overall, uh, it's very similar results from the uh, manual decontamination. Uh, so this is the uh, 2.1 version of the workflow. Uh, while this is being used to assemble um, genome currently, we are also working on the 2.2 version, uh, including among other things, uh, AGP-based workflow, uh, including AGP faster reconciliation to keep to preserve the graph information that are provided by the initial high analysis, 
uh, until the end of the scaffolds. Uh, we also implement implementing the YES tool, yet another high C uh, scaffolding tool, uh, in replacement of SASA for the uh, last step of scaffolding. And we are working on uh, multi QC uh, add on to merge the uh, quality control over the whole analysis for a final unique report. So, in addition to uh, implementing the pipeline in Galaxy, this project has led to a specific development in Galaxy uh, aiming to big workflow and big analysis. Uh, one of these things is the uh, AWS data retrieval. Uh, you, we can now access uh, the uh, genome report data from Genome Arc uh, AWS. Uh, repository, including the genomic data and the completed uh, assembly from the uh, data upload directly into Galaxy. Um, another development has been uh, export tool and workflow. Uh, so it's a scary workflow, but the um, larger box on the extreme right is a tool that takes into uh, inputs uh, destination distant files. So in that case, it's dedicated to the export back to the AWS repo for uh, the GP. And it takes a full path, including folder and subfolder, so you can build an architecture uh, to send your own file to. And that is why the rest of this scary workflow is, is um, creating the right path for the uh, right for the output of the analysis workflow. And since the, the history are gigantic, we have dozens of inputs and dozens of um, data sets in the history. Uh, we have we are uh, filtering by type. You can see on the bottom right, we have a type filter uh, scaffolded S1 in this example. And these tags are applied during the analysis workflow. And uh, we select as inputs of the workflow the file, the data sets having this um, tag. So this is another uh, new development. Uh, so when you filter by a tag, uh, when you run the workflow or you're going to have in the input available for the workflow only the file tag with this one. So that way, when the people running the BGP analysis want to export, everything is already pre-filled. They, uh, they don't have to manually scroll from among all the data sets in the history. So all these uh, workflow are available in IWC. Some of them are already merged in the main uh, repository. Other ones are uh, still in pull request while we are working up last test automatic testing, but you can uh, download it from uh, IWC whenever you want. And the tools are available in .org.en.eu, uh, including, oh, they're not doing uh, this, but there's an assembly.usegalaxy.eu that is dedicated to the VGP program, uh, including presentation with all the workflow and tools available. But you can export the workflow in .eu and .org and run them there. Uh, the still work in progress with uh, Galaxy Australia to get all the tool uh, up and running. Uh, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk today and also uh, thanks all the people who collaborated in this project in the VGP team and the Galaxy team and people who like didn't participate directly in the project, but uh, who participate to the development that makes all this possible. Uh, if you want to know more about the pipeline, we have developed two tutorials uh, that are available in the GTN assembly um, section. Thank you very much. Questions? So uh, repeat the question. So uh, the question is if the data type have been decided uh, beforehand of the reason for choosing this data type, including nanopore long width. And the answer is uh, so this is the data type that have been financed through the BGB project, but there's also in the work a uh, nanopore version of the of the initial assembly uh, that is really early in the work, but eventually we, we want to discuss we want to include nanopores as well. Other questions? Thank you very much. Oh, oh. oh. sorry. Are you planning to 
So for example, in the COVID project, we have this uh, ability to trigger all the workflows in the API. And I can provide tutorials on how to do that because I think that tutorials will be very useful for all of the future projects. So the question is, um, for example, in the COVID project, there's an ability, possibility to trigger the workflow through API instead of going through the interface. And uh, it's been discussed. It's it's a goal we have to be able to run it uh, on command line without going through the interface. Uh, but we haven't started working on it yet. But it's going to be eventually. Yeah. Uh, so this is starting pro. Uh, sorry, the question is, uh, what is the endpoint of this uh, project if it's going to be available in several <coughs> other phases? And so this is the phase one of the project. The goal is to have all the uh, assembly and reference to in the AWS repo. And the second phase of the VGP project is to build annotation and and run analysis. So eventually, the goal is to have this resource available uh, completely. And once assembled automatically through the pipeline, the genome also sent to for curation. Um, and so eventually the goal is to have it available everywhere. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. So our next speaker, our next speaker is uh, Timothy Griffin. So, but you know. All right, great. I will get right to it. Thank you very much. So, um, hi everyone. I'm here to uh, present some work from our team. Uh, this is work here at the University of Minnesota. So, a short walk over the river is where this is going on on uh, campus. Um, uh, very much a team effort. Uh, people from the Supercomputing Institute, as well as my laboratory in biochemistry, and also uh, some collaborators from uh, Chicago and the Lurie's uh, Children's Hospital there. And we're working on uh, cystic fibrosis uh, analysis using proteomics uh, and the Galaxy tools. So um, real quickly, just kind of the background. So the overall goal of this project is uh, cystic fibrosis, obviously a pretty well-known disease, but there's a lot of questions about the bacterial uh, contributions to it, whether it's a consequence or, or actually plays some sort of a positive role in, in some of the negative clinical aspects of cystic fibrosis. So we're working with a team that has access to these uh, bronchial, la, bronchial alveolar lavage fluid samples, BELL. Um, it's a sample that they can use a special scope into the lungs and basically flush cells and other uh, molecules off of the lungs and bring those out. Um, so we're analyzing those samples using mass spectrometry to try to identify proteins that are coming from bacteria that may give us a clue as potentially even their functional uh, signatures, but also as a, as a marker and sort of a quantitative way to, to, to assay the bacteria, as well as the host proteins that, that are a part of these samples. So that's kind of the long and short of it, using mass spectrometry and, and also Galaxy to, um, to analyze this data. So this is kind of the workflow. I'm not going to go into every piece of this other than that we have access to cystic fibrosis samples as well as disease controls, which are uh, samples that are other lung conditions that are not cystic fibrosis as a control. Um, a couple of key aspects that are shown in this slide is that we're, what we've done at the start here is taken these valve samples and pooled together uh, different patient groups and analyze these, trying to do a really deep uh, dive with the mass spectrometer to understand what can we detect in terms of bacterial and human proteins. We also have some, some 16S data that gives us at least an idea of what bacteria are there. That's important because it gives us a sense of kind of the protein space, the proteomes that we should be looking at in terms of these samples. And then we've taken them through a, a pretty rigorous bioinformatic analysis, uh, mostly uh, based in Galaxy. This is just kind of another look at that. It's really kind of these two phases that we've used. Um, so in this slide, it, it kind of shows you the overall design. So we have 
disease control, cystic fibrosis, we also have their microbial diversity, whether it's high or low based on that 16S data. So we kind of group these into these pooled samples, push these through the mass spectrometer. Um, it gets a little dicey when you're doing what we call metaproteomics, because now when we have, even with 16S RNA, lots of proteomes, we get these huge databases. We use a tool called MetaNovo that gives us for sort of a first pass with the mass spec data to say, okay, here, here's the, the, the organisms that we think are actually present based on the, the initial signatures of the mass spec data. So it kind of reduces down our database. We've then kind of taken, I guess, this sort of kitchen sink approach of using different tools to analyze the, that reduced database to understand what proteins are there given that these tools have some complementary uh, uh, identifications. So this is just showing the proteins and the peptides and in blue shows those proteins and peptides that match the bacterial proteins. The rest of these are human. So this isn't a surprise. These are primarily human proteins we're detecting, but we're trying to tease out those bacterial proteins as well. Um, and from there, we then take these bacterial proteins and take them through a pretty rigorous validation step. We use a tool called PEP query to really try to make sure are these really truly confident and real matches to bacteria and not human proteins. So there's a, a, a pretty rigorous step there that happens. And Catherine Doe is the one who's really put together these figures and done a lot of this, this part of this analysis. Um, and once we have what we think are, are sort of our, our peptides from, from uh, microbial uh, proteins of interest, we can then do some analysis. This is from this UniPEP tool that shows sort of the, the phylo, phylogenetic tree, so to speak, of where these proteins are coming from. I just highlighted Pseudomonas. This is a very well-known pathogen within cystic fibrosis. So we're definitely seeing some things that are make some sense, but there's also a, a, a sort of profile here of other things as well that are, that are of interest. And from there, we're then taking these and we've, we've done a lot of manual as well as looking at the quantitative response of some of these bacterial uh, peptides. And that's where we come up with this sort of panel of 87 very stringently filtered peptides. This is showing in the mass spectrometer, there's some ways to go back in and actually reconstruct the signal from this peptide. So these nice colorful plots are sort of all the fragmentations from any given peptide that, that, that were used to detect that sequence. And you can sort of build those back up to confirm that this is a real sequence. You can also quantify this, this data using sort of this area under the curve. So we definitely see some, some quanti quantities of these different peptides from different bacteria that, that seem to show some interesting uh, possibilities as well as uh, Moraxella is a very common up, upper aerial digest, uh, air, aerial tract bacteria. So not a surprise to see that there, but not necessarily one that is CF, CF associated. So shows that, that, that it's in these controls, but not as much in the CF. Um, and really where we're going to with this is not just the bacteria part of this, but what we think is really kind of novel here is that we can, in the same assay, look also at the human proteins. So I know this is kind of a busy slide, but what we've done with the human proteins, which we have a lot more data on, is gone in and tried to do some, some analysis on, you know, what are some of the sub pathways and functions that we see that are enriched either in the CF or in the, in the disease controls at the human protein level. And where we're trying to go with this is now kind of construct this panel of peptides that we could now target really create an assay that you could go back into clinical samples and watch the dynamics of bacteria and human proteins of selected pathways and how do they change under, under certain disease conditions and things. So we're almost there. We're trying to validate these and do some and develop these targeted assays, which fingers crossed will we'll kind of show some results in, in clinical samples. So last little piece is we have a metaproteomics uh, workshop today. If you're interested in metaproteomics, which is heavily used here. So um, come and check that out at 120 if you want. That's what I have, and I could maybe take a question or two. We have time for one question. Um, so this was done using full scan acquisition or also targeted? Great question. The question was, is this a full scan acquisition or targeted? So all of the data initially was untargeted, just open-ended. Uh, proteomics. So um, just trying to select everything we could and identify what's there. 
But then we are going now and we're starting to follow this up with PRM, so targeted. So now we know our markers, peptides. Let's see if we can detect those and confirm they're real. So hopefully it will all become targeted pretty soon. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Up next is uh, Dr. Jeremy Gex from uh, actually the same institution as me, which just used. It's my opportunity to give him a hard time. But uh, yes, Galaxy and uh, machine learning. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to the hard time class. Um, so, yeah, my name is Jeremy Gex. I'm a faculty member at Oregon Health and Science University. And it's my pleasure to talk to you today about advances in machine learning for Galaxy. And I have the pleasure of talking about work from several individuals across the community, and I'll highlight them along the way. So the key points that I want to talk about today are kind of threefold. One, I want to share an overview of the machine learning work that we've done in Galaxy from past to present, so kind of draw this arc across where we've started and where we're going. Uh, and in particular, I want to highlight two different recent advances that we've done with respect to machine learning that hopefully give you some insight into how we're thinking about this process and how we think Galaxy can contribute um, and make possible machine learning analyses. And then finally, end with future directions for machine learning for Galaxy. So kind of level set and make sure we're on the same page. Many of you probably know that machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence where you use data to understand patterns and identify different trends that are, you can then use to predict outcomes in the future. Deep learning is a further subset of machine learning that happens to use these neural networks. And it's called deep because instead of only a couple layers of neurons, you have many layers of neurons. And you can see with this kind of example here up, maybe, um, in this super high quality projector, that as you move across the layers, you get more and more advanced feature detection. So you start off with things like edges, but you eventually get things like eyes and faces. Okay, so if we think about where machine learning is applicable, this is a slide that we put together a while back, thinking about machine learning for biomedicine, thinking about the idea with it collect data at home, you can collect data at a clinic, you can apply machine learning models to many of these different data sets. But of course, we know that machine learning is useful not only in biomedicine, but to other places like ecology as well. I saw a really interesting study recently where somebody used machine learning to identify the different trees that were present in satellite images. So machine learning has wide applications. We want to do so in Galaxy. And so what we've done over the last couple of years is we developed a toolkit called Galaxy ML. It took kind of the best practices and um, libraries that were already out there in the community and stuck them into Galaxy. Things you've probably heard of, some, such as Scikit-Learn, some other tools such as XGBoost, imbalanced learning, if you're familiar with that, where you have challenges of one class being underrepresented and other classes being overrepresented, and also some deep learning libraries as well. We wrapped all these into Galaxy to provide an end-to-end -end approach where you can take your data sets in Galaxy, do the training, do the testing, do the evaluation, and actually do the visualization as well. And when you take these machine learning toolkits and you stick them inside the Galaxy framework, what I think you get is some very nice um, abilities to do things that are hard to do otherwise. In particular, you can do scalable and reproducible machine learning. So we take advantage of the scalability and reproducibility that Galaxy provides, and we combine it with these machine learning tools. And so over here, you see some heat maps where we ran and created thousands of machine learning models and compared them to each other across many data sets to try to identify which models were most appropriate and best performing on different data sets. And then on the, um, sorry, I made my right some maps. Um, so on the right here, heat maps, but on the far left, you see an example of some deep learning applications that we applied as well. And those curves are simply different architectures and different data sets that we went and mapped out predictions on. So we think that the synergy of these machine learning libraries coupled with Galaxy's powerful infrastructure is quite valuable. Okay, so that's what we've done. What's new? Um, I wanna talk about two things that are new with respect to machine learning and Galaxy. Number one comes from the University of Freiburg led by Anup Kumar and Bjorn Bruning. And this is Galaxy Jupyter Lab for AI. The idea here is that Galaxy can run interactive tools. We'll hear more about this hopefully as the conference goes on. The idea with these interactive tools is that you can spin up these kind of sub web environments inside of Galaxy. These interactive tools are, of course, quite powerful, but what's been done in this particular instance is they've taken this idea of an interactive tool and they've loaded it up with lots of things that you want to be able to do when you do machine learning in the context of JupyterLab. 
And Jupyter Lab is, of course, this online or interactive notebook where you can type in uh, your Python code, for instance, and execute in real time. So in making this interactive tool, they've put in core aspects of machine learning, and in particular, deep learning approaches to make it possible to run these uh, calculations on GPUs. Many pre-installed packages, once again, so you don't have to spend your time installing things and getting them set up. Get integration, integration with different model formats so that you can import and export models. Uh, one of the things that is pretty important, and I'm going to go a little bit off script here, is the idea that you can use models that are widely available in the community. So rather than building up your own models, what you really want to be able to do oftentimes is take models that other people have created and apply them to your own data. Well, this requires the ability to import these data sets of recognition of these different formats. And all of this is really nicely baked into JupyterLab, um, this particular application. Of particular interest is something that we've seen already, where you start to connect these notebook environments back to Galaxy and say, well, I'm in a notebook environment, but I want to use some of the powers that Galaxy offers. And so here, what you're seeing is an example where you can walk through and you can take your machine learning model and go back and use Galaxy to train it. So you're sitting inside this interactive tool, but you write a script, and then you go back and you can talk to a Galaxy server and say, okay, I want you to execute and train this model. I don't want to train it on my small Docker container where my notebook is running. I want to use the power of Galaxy. So again, we're starting to take these aspects of machine learning, take advantage of the framework that Galaxy provides. If you want to learn more about the Galaxy Jupyter Lab for AI, there are some links here, and I'll make sure I tweet out my slides so you don't have to try to copy these links down. Um, but there are tutorials, there's a preprint on that, and then finally there's a lab that you can actually try out there right now. The second advance I want to talk about is something that's called declarative deep learning. So declarative programming is probably familiar to many of you, either because you've used it explicitly in the context of Galaxy or you've seen it elsewhere. It's the idea that what you want to do is not necessarily tell the computer how to do something. You just want to say what to do. And so the particular problem that this is trying to overcome when you think about declarative programming with respect to deep learning is that it's often difficult to build these models. You have many, many layers that you're trying to define and connect them together. And there's complex syntax involved. So this is a hard problem to solve, even in the context of Galaxy, where we provide nice UIs. And there are UIs for building up deep learning models in Galaxy. But the solution is to use a simpler approach where you take something like YAML, once again, or another format, and you declare what you want to do. So what you're seeing here on the left is a simple uh, set of commands that say, these are the features that I want you to encapsulate. Here are the outputs that I want you to encapsulate. Go off and build a model for me. And there's a particular toolkit out there called Ludwig right now. It started out at Uber, but now it's hosted by Stanford. And it allows you to set up these YAML files and then build up your deep learning models accordingly. And so the key advantage here, if we can take, uh, take full advantage of this particular framework, is that it's minimal and it's simple code to implement pretty complex models. We can talk and we can discuss about how much visibility we need to get inside these models to make sure that they're useful and make sure that they're doing what we want them to do. But as a first step, they really lower the barrier in terms of taking these models and using them in your own research. So what we've done, as you would expect, since I mentioned Ludwig and we're here at the Galaxy conference, is we've taken Ludwig and we've exposed its functionality inside Galaxy. In particular, the Galaxy tools that we have mirror the Ludwig concepts of encoders and combiners and decoders. This is a pretty simple concept that says, if I have a bunch of input features, I'm gonna encode them into my network. Then I'm going to combine them in a particular way, and then finally I'm going to decode to get the outputs that I want to predict. And so you can do this using custom approaches, or we can get these predefined models that I talked about before. So things like ResNet for image analysis is possible to do inside Ludwig with a single line, and we can do visualizations on top of it. So Ludwig is quite good about saying you're going to run many iterations of your model. Here, let me visualize them side by side so I can evaluate the performance. So here's the example application that we've done so far. KI67 is a common biomarker in cancer in particular. You care about this because often this is a sign that the tumor is growing rapidly or proliferating rapidly. And so in this particular application, there was a data set by a public, from a publication where the goal was to predict KI67 positive cells versus KI67 negative cells. This is a common thing. So you get a slide from a tumor and you say 20% of the cells are positive. Pathologists are pretty good at this. It would be nice if we could automate this to some degree. 
And so we took this example data set. You can see some examples of positive and negative cells right here. And we put it into Galaxy and we use Ludwig. And I'm showing you the rough configuration here where we have the input features. In this case, just a set of images. We have some output features that we want to get out of it, in particular, the label, positive or negative. And we ran this through Galaxy. So this wasn't a lot of code to be able to bring this up pretty quickly and to reproduce something that was out there in the community. So this is a nice demonstration of the power of what we get to. And we got pretty accurate results, as you can see, that mirrored what they found in the publication. So looking forward now, some of the future directions that we're looking for. Again, I emphasize this point of being able to use what's out there in the community and build on top of it. And they often call these model zoos, as it turns out, where these zoos are uh, places where you hold these different models that people have created. So we'd like to be able to integrate more tightly with these zoos that are out there. Um, Ludwig is a good first step. Um, Galaxy Jupiter Lab for AI is a good first step, but we can do better. And so we're looking at how to do that. Additional tools for visualizing and understanding performance are always needed when it comes to machine learning. These models are complex. It's hard to understand sometimes what they're doing, but we can, um, of course, advance that by introducing additional visualizations and understanding performance. We, of course, want to be able to push the state of the art forward in terms of scientific applications as well. So I've talked mostly about infrastructure today, but we, of course, want to partner with our scientific collaborators and say, let's actually do new analyses in Galaxy with these machine learning toolkits. COVID and cancer are two examples that I know of that are going on in the Galaxy community right now. And then finally, at more of an infrastructure level, there's an interest, and there's been a longstanding interest in using machine learning to improve how Galaxy works and orchestrates its tools. So in particular, when Galaxy chooses to run an analysis job, it has to figure out what resources are likely to be needed and then assign it to the proper queue. And so what we're working on in terms of the core Galaxy community and the team is to do this prediction of job resource needs based on historical data and then tie that back into Galaxy. So a really nice application of Galaxy that's not scientific, but will help Galaxy function much better. Okay. So the, the final thing I want to mention today is that there is a machine learning workshop tomorrow morning, um, excuse me, tomorrow afternoon at 1.20, led by Kayvon Kamala. So I encourage you all, if you're interested in machine learning and learning about what you can do right now with respect to Galaxy, um, you can stop in tomorrow and learn at that workshop. Okay, so the acknowledgments. I had a pleasure today of talking about um, the Galaxy Jupiter Lab for AI done by Kamar and Bjorn Grinig. Penn State University, Kayvon Kamali and Anton Nekutenko are doing a bunch of machine learning work there. And then at Oregon Health and Science University, Chang Gu and the sergeant have helped out tremendously with bringing up these toolkits as well. And we have ample funding uh, and fortunate funding from NIH um, in a variety of places. So thank you very much. Jeremy, I've got 2,000 for e-pictures. Um, okay. Do you have any way to pre-process these images? I need to repeat this question for the people online, right? <laughs> yes. um, so um, a very exciting question came up with our 2,000 turkey pictures. And the question is, what are we going to do with those 2,000 turkey pictures? So what are you hoping to do with your 2,000 turkey pictures? Well, they're all kinds of sizes, okay. all kinds of frames. Mm -hmm. uh, Probably need to be normalized for color levels. Okay. How do I do that in Galaxy? There are pre processing and normalization tools that are built into this framework to do that type of analysis before you do the machine learning. So, oftentimes, machine learning, as we've talked about it today, is this concept of predicting different labels. So, maybe you want to predict a turkey that's going to grow very big or a turkey that's going to be very friendly, for instance. And you could label your turkeys and then you could decide on that. But if you need to do pre processing up front, that's fine. There are also unsupervised machine learning tools in Galaxy as well, where you could cluster your turkeys, for instance, based on particular attributes, um, whether it's color or size or something like that. That's a great question. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, thanks for your presentation. You mentioned that model zoo. Is that the same idea as a model of And also, does it include that feature? 
I would say the models do are okay. So the question is, are models do the same thing as model registry? And then I don't quite understand the context of the second question, which is the features that you were asking about. Is there a way, way to, so feature engineering? So when you take an input, is mm -hmm. there a way to sort of replicate that to the feature engineering process? Mm -hmm. uh, and then sort of store that away so that the people can communicate through the process. Sure. Okay. So. Let me address the first question because I think that's a pretty simple answer. I would say the model registries are the same thing as models is. And actually, model registries sound better, so maybe I'll adopt that term in future talks. The second question was about pre processing and features. And here it's a little bit, um, it depends on the model and the approach that you want to use. So, in traditional machine learning, you would also often separate your pre processing from your model building, for instance. So, you might normalize your data and scale it and then you would run it through say a logistic regression model and you could create a galaxy pipeline that would do these different steps and hand that off to someone so they could do that deep learning models tend oftentimes to do all of this internal in a black box so you just get the machine uh, the deep learning model it will do the feature pre-processing along the way as well as the classification of the regression so i would say there's absolutely ways to do the feature engineering if you want to inside this toolkit but it depends on your particular approach, whether you need one tool or whether you need a, a more traditional workflow where there are, where there are multiple steps. Yeah, okay. great I think, question. Yeah, I think that's all the time we have for questions for right now. So any more questions about uh, how to image process turkeys, please take them to Slack. I think we'll have a very interesting discussion there. <laughs> Next, we have Andrew. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Chesky. I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Minnesota. I want to talk to you a bit about a project I've been working on. Uh, bottom up against fire, comparing bottom up proteomics and a modified Edmund degradation methodology for automated, untargeted protein adaptomics analysis within the Galaxy platform. So, uh, you and I are constantly being uh, exposed to reactive chemicals um, every day of our lives. Uh, this uh, cohort is called the exposome, and it comes from a number of different sources from exogenous uh, or endogenous um, uh, metabolic byproducts to uh, specific exposures uh, from occupational hazards and environmental pollutants. Uh, these are of interest because of their uh, direct toxicity as well as their mutagenic and um, oncogenic uh, potentialities. Uh, because the exposome consists of highly reactive electrophiles, they can readily form adducts on nucleophilic uh, biomolecules. Uh, this collection of modifications is termed the adductome and serves as an invaluable record of the exposome and as, as well as a potential source of exposure biomarkers uh, to tailor individual uh, patient care. Uh, classically, um, sorry. Classically, uh, DNA adducts have been highly studied um, because of their direct impact on DNA replication as well as gene tra uh, translation. However, they tend to be very low abundance and have a very short um, half-life uh, due to the presence of uh, uh, DNA uh, repair enzymes. Uh, by contrast, uh, protein adducts uh, tend to be um, uh, very long-lived as they're not repaired or just recycled as the proteins are. So high abundance proteins that are long-lived such as uh, serum albumin and hemoglobin uh, make for ideal uh, candidates for the study of uh, long uh, the long-term exposome. So, uh, one strategy that's been successfully employed in this regard uh, has been the analysis of uh, adducts at the end termini of hemoglobin molecules. Um, the Tornquist lab at Stockholm University has pioneered a methodology to study these adducts called the FIRE method, which is an acronym uh, up here, uh, FITSI for the measurement of adducts, R, by a modified admin uh, procedure, uh, FIRE. Um, it doesn't work any better in Swedish. Um, uh, but basically, uh, if you remember back to your elementary biochemistry, uh, it's essentially modified Edmund degradation where fluorescein isocyanate is added to hemoglobin and it will uh, form this uh, cyclic molecule with the N-terminal valine, which is then uh, uh, comes off of the rest of the protein, which can then be uh, cleaned up by SPE and then analyzed by a, a LCMS. 
Uh, while this has been uh, shown to be very successful in identifying a number of adducts and determinants, the problem is that the, the fire method can have undesirable side reactions and also has been shown to be somewhat ineffectual towards uh, larger electrophiles. Uh, to this end, uh, uh, we hypothesize that a simple bottom up proteomics approach uh, could supplement, if not outright, replace fire. So, um, in these sorts of experiments, hemoglobin is uh, isolated through um, lysis of red blood cells with uh, pure water and then just digested with trypsin, cleaned up, and run on a uh, mass spectrometer, and sort of standard bottom up proteomics uh, workflow. Uh, so uh, to test our hypothesis, we got some donor blood and exposed it to a series of six electrophilic compounds. These were incubated at blood, with blood at various dosages and incubation times, after which the blood was divided into two, subjected to fire and bottom-up proteomics. So we found with fire that only some of the expected internal adducts were observed. Uh, these uh, top four in green had a nice linear dose response. Uh, this 2-MGN uh, was only barely detectable uh, in a nonlinear fashion, and this red uh, electrophile here, DNCB, we did not see any adducts at all. By contrast, with bottom-up proteomics, uh, we can detect all six of these adducts at the end termini. Um, here is a um, uh, MS, uh, tandem mass spectrum of uh, this N-terminal beta peptide with the DNCB adduct, and also with bottom-up proteomics, you can differentiate between alpha chain and beta chain and terminize where these adducts are forming. What's more, when you use bottom-up proteomics, uh, this allows for the detection of uh, side chain adducts because many ebonized and side chains are highly nucleophilic. Um, these are detected adducts uh, in our hemoglobin samples. And as you can see here, this beta cysteine 93 is especially good uh, reservoir for electrophilic adducts. So uh, what does this all have to do with galaxy? Um, uh, these uh, experiments we did were Done with known electrophiles. So, in a real sample, we would be, this would be wholly agnostic. We wouldn't know what we're looking for. So, to do that, uh, we've adapted a software package uh, from the Rappaport lab called Adactomics R, which essentially has a designated control peptide, and you look for mass differences from that control peptide to look for potential electrophiles. So, uh, this program was originally developed for human serum albumin, and we've since uh, adapted it to take on human hemoglobin as well as rat hemoglobin given its uh, prominence as a model organism. So uh, the way that this uh, workflow works within Galaxy is raw MS data comes in, it's converted to a more amenable file type. Adducts omics R is able to give you a list of N-terminal adducts, which would then be searched against a uh, adduct, uh, adduct database of DNA and protein adducts. Um, known and unknown adducts can be flagged, and then uh, statistical validation can be uh, done on these. So this is currently um, uh, in process, and once that's done, we will be doing a long term uh, study of the unknown adductome of smokers and non smokers. So, uh, with that, I'd like to thank all the people that uh, worked on this with me. And if you have some questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you. Yes. Um, what are you trying to look for with the adduct? So, you look for known specific adducts which constitute certain exposures or? Um, Yes, well, yes and no. Um, with this, we're trying to do uh, have it be fully agnostic, but we don't know what adducts uh, we're looking for. There have been some studies where certain adducts, like um, earlier here, I showed you uh, this acrylamide has been shown to be uh, a biomarker in hemoglobin of exposure to various chemicals and say people who work in the polymer industry and this has been correlated with certain cancers. So the idea is. Um, can we sort of go back, find novel adducts that might be useful at um, biomarkers for different diseases? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, uh, the last talk of this session. Oh, introduction. <laughs> I don't need introduction. You need no introduction. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Sabina Mehta from the Galaxy for Proteomics team uh, at the University of Minnesota. Am I too loud or just perfect? All right, thank you. 
so basically, I'm not going to go over this long title. It's just saying that we develop galaxy workflows that could detect various specific peptides from clinical samples. So COVID-19, uh, I don't think I want to say anything about COVID-19 anymore. Everybody wants to get rid of it. And everybody here has a PhD on COVID-19. So I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, we have two tests, basically, I mean, more than two tests, but molecular based assays, antibody testing, uh, antigen testing. You guys all have packets for that. Uh, but there's also mass spectrometry based testing for COVID-19. So uh, last year, we just, I mean, when Bjorn said, okay, why don't you go ahead and do some COVID-19 proteomics? We were like, okay, let's start with COVID-19 proteomics. And we decided we'll publish papers on COVID-19. Uh, the first was to basically detect uh, COVID-19 peptides in clinical samples and also create a peptide panel that could be easy for targeted uh, COVID-19 detection. Uh, that was one of the paper. And the other paper was to create metaproteomics, uh, to create workflows that could detect metaproteomics, uh, COVID-19 analysis, and to detect any potential co-infected microorganisms uh, in your COVID-19 samples. So that means that if there is any pathogen in COVID-19 patients or positive patients that could be fatal for them. So that's what we were doing with our workflows. Uh, while this was going on, there were waves and waves of COVID-19 coming up with different variants. And we thought we should like end up with two papers, but that was not it. We just decided, okay, if there are variants coming up, why not like develop workflows that can detect these different variants in, uh, in COVID samples, clinical samples. But what are these variants? I mean, we are not trying to detect everything, like all the kind of images, but all, we were just concerned about main causes of the uh, waves, which is the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, omicron, so we just thought like, can we detect like peptides from all these different waves? So we had uh, like a theory in mind, let's select databases from different timelines from 2020 to 2022 and across the globe, different demographics, different parts of the clinical sample, nasopharyngeal, oral samples, pulse samples, urine samples, can we detect COVID? and then specifically the different variants, uh, WHO specified variants, and have a pe peptide target list or a peptide panel, a list of peptides that could be used for targeted assays later on. So we ended up developing two workflows, discovery workflow as a, a sorry, discovery workflow and verification workflow, wherein First was to identify any COVID uh, peptides present in the samples that we had. And the second was to verify whether the peptides that we detected were actually present as well as then annotate them into the various, uh, uh, the variants. So let's get to the first workflow. Uh, the first workflow basically, as I mentioned, is identification. So um, in our previously published papers, we just use search query peptide shaker as our search engine. But uh, in this workflow, we just added more because you would just be, you know, let's identify more. Uh, so the basic input is the MSMS data, uh, which is the mass spectrometry files. And then we used COVID-19 sequence database, contaminant database, and protein sequence database, uh, human protein sequence database as a combined database. The COVID-19 sequence database consists of not just the Wuhan type, which has all the proteins, but we also have COVID-19 uh, structural proteins in the um, COVID-19 sequence database, everything we got from to say. And the contaminant database is usually for human errors and seeing if we have any human uh, contaminants or you know, experimental contaminants. And then because these were human samples, we have human protein database. So we use search queen peptide shaker as well as MaxCon for searching. The output that we got were, we had tons and tons of chapter output from uh, these search engines, but we just took the peptide outputs from these search engines. And then from all the identifications, we extracted only COVID-19 confident peptides. We filtered out the human peptides, the contaminants, as well as anything that matched some like other uh, known proteins, but we just extracted COVID-19 confident. Peptides. 
there's another output uh, from this is MZ to SQLite output, which we will later use to uh, look at the spectra from all these peptides and annotate them manually to know whether the spectra that we got from these peptides are of good quality or not. Uh, this is how the lorry heat for that, um, for one of the uh, sample peptide looks like. So if like all the, I don't know, uh, if you can see if there are like continuous blue and continuous uh, red lines, then you say, okay, that's a good spectra. And all the peaks here should be like threefold more than the gray ones right there. So that's what we're looking at the spectra, but that goes in the next workflow. So when we ran the discovery workflow for all of our 12 uh, data sets, we got about 103 peptides that were unique to COVID-19. And what we did was we added these uh, 103 peptides to previously published 803 peptides that we had from our paper as well as other published papers, and then created a peptide panel of 906 peptides. Now we used Pep query tool, which is a validation tool, which tells you whether these peptides are present in your sample or not. So we reanalyzed our 12 peptides and using these 906 peptides and got, I think, 114 peptides that validated. And these were, we made sure that these did not have any human as well as contaminant proteins in them. Once we had that, we uh, looked at, and these, this is how PEP query results look like. I mean, it's not very clear, but it has a peptide column, and then it tells you which file it came from, plus it gives you uh, a p-value associated with it and a confidence associated with it. So that's how we filter out our, our confidence peptides. Um, once we did that, we also uh, looked at the spectra, like I showed you before. We had to manually uh, go through all the 114 peptides and got approximately 82 peptides, which were of good quality, and we were confident that these are COVID peptides. Now, obviously, our next question was, which of these COVID peptides are variant peptides? So for that, we did last P. Uh, when I did first time last P on US Galaxy, I just realized that the Galaxy P Blast NR was out of date. It was 2018, so it did not contain any COVID-19. Uh, the recent uh, coronavirus uh, peptides, so I had to go outside of Galaxy, uh, do the NR as well as last P searches, and align them to the Wuhan type uh, so that I can find if there is any variance from the wild type, as well as uh, I did last P NR to just to make sure that they, they did not come from any other coronavirus. So it was mostly to validate that these are indeed COVID-19 and variant peptides. So we looked at multiple things. Once that was done and we were confident, like, okay, these are maybe variant peptides because they didn't have 100% coverage or they didn't have 100% match to the one type. So we took these uh, peptides and annotated them by looking at the peptide report that we got from our previous searches, as well as we, uh, we have a collaborator uh, whom we asked to write an R script who could take our peptides compared to the pango lineages and they gave us whatever pango lineages that peptides match to. So there were some peptides that had like multiple pango lineages associated with it, but there are some peptides that are specific to a certain pango lineage. And then we looked at the pango lineage in the CoV2 uh, lineage website, the org website, and they had those mutations present in them from these WHO-based uh, uh, variants. So if you see here, you can see uh, these are few of the peptides that we detected. Uh, the wild type is on the top, and then the uh, variant-specific strain uh, peptides on the bottom, and the ones in red are showing the mutations from the compared to the wild type. And as you can see, we have like gamma, delta, omicron strains here, so from the different waves from different samples. So that kind of proved like, okay, our workflows did detect these variant peptides. Uh, few things that we did manually also, we had to align these peptides uh, and to the wild type strain and also see like given coverage, different coverage. Uh, these are the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, all these different waves uh, that came and the color are coded like that. Um, we found out that these all the strains that passed our confidence 
and probably they were being a lot stringent. Most of them, when you took capsipeptide, did not get a lot of spike proteins uh, because of the, maybe the de digestion enzymes we used. And because they were clinical samples, we were not getting spike proteins, but we were getting um, nuclear capsid proteins, and which had good uh, mutations in the newer ways compared to the beta because it was more conserved with the viral cell. So those were a few of our results we got. And then um, here are the six uh, peptides that we were confident about that came from uh, different uh, strains. Delta, Gamma, Omicron. We do have alpha, but we didn't find any beta in our samples, but probably because we didn't have many samples, it was just 12 data sets. And these were like published data sets. So if we have more, we could do uh, more research with using our two work groups. So um, with that, I would like to conclude and say uh, that our workflows are flexible enough to detect emerging strains from clinical samples, but Hopefully we don't have to run it again, and I hope this is the last thing that comes up. Um, second is that the peptide panels could be used to develop vaccines. Uh, the variant peptides could be uh, can be actually used for targeted assays, uh, assays because now that we have these variant peptides, we could do PRM SRM assays to detect them. And the last thing is our workflows can be manipulated to detect other pathogenic organisms. So it's not only uh, confined to detect uh, COVID-19. You can just change the database and the parameters and use it for other organisms too. So um, I would like to thank all the collaborators and um, Galaxy P team to help out with this project. And if any questions, I would like to answer. Questions? Mm -hmm. I wonder if wastewater the possible source of input for your um, for this kind of this methodology. Mm -hmm. So the question is if wastewater data could be used for running these workflows to detect COVID-19 samples. Yeah. yeah, I mean we could. We haven't tried it because we haven't gotten the data yet. Uh, but yeah, that could be used. Um, uh, the only issue is we have will have a lot of data and a lot of microorganisms, other microorganisms because it's wastewater. So our database has to be, you know, a, it will be a large database to search it against, but yeah. Uh, so it seems like we can use this as an uh, alternative to validate some of the variants which come from the sequencing. For example, there is a question of uh, if some of the yield absorbed in SARS cov or not. Did you do any comparison between what you get from your data and what's in the sequence space? So uh, the question is whether I compare it to the sequence that's already published. Uh, incongruent. So like I actually tried and compared it with whatever was already published. So people in uh, like COVID 2 linkages has like amino acid mutations already mentioned. So I have just done that, but I haven't like compared it with the other variants. Yeah. <laughs> Can you help me understand for someone who's not a proteomics expert? I think COVID has something like 30 proteins, but you're finding a thousand peptides. Are those peptides being produced? One thousand peptides from 30 proteins during degradation? Yeah. So, sorry, but the question was <laughs> whether you're finding all these peptides, uh, there are only 30 proteins in COVID 19, and we're finding thousands of peptides. and is it during degradation? Yeah, the peptides cut at different sites. It depends on the digestion enzyme you're using, but we using trypsin mainly, so it cuts the protein into different parts. And yeah, we have a lot more peptides. Any last questions before the break? Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.